district. Roll call. Let's start with Joe. Present. Paul Rodriguez. Present. Jason Greenleaf is absent. Charlie Anderson. Here. Ben Viola. Here. And Ms. Judith Cara Cavalleros also has an excused absence. All right. Next order of business is election of officers. Aubrey Strauss has retired from the district when she moved to Brunswick, so we need a new vice chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would move uh, that Ben Viola be elected vice chairman to replace Aubrey to complete her term. I'll second that. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? None opposed. Moved. Thank you. Approval of the minutes from February 28, 2019. <laughs> Move approval. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any corrections? I had a correction on page five. It seemed like a correction. Down in the uh, bullet number two, uh, capacity reserve fees, this lot is full, fully subject to the district's capacity reserve. Two should be added. I the word TO. Yes. Any more? I had two to add to that one. Uh, let's see. Page two, bullet I under four. It's the second line, second sentence. It says the price in 6.6 .6 cents per kilowatt hour. To read, the price came in. Or should that be is? Or, yeah, you're right. That might work better. The price is. Good point. Thank you, Ben. You're and I had one on page seven. One, two, three. Sixth paragraph down, starting with the superintendent said. So they are, they have, they are, should be replaced with that. Any more discussion? Okay, all in favor? Not opposed. Thank you. Superintendent's report. Hey. Uh, a copy of the monthly report of operations for the month of February is included in your packet. Our average effluent flow for the month was 1.33 million gallons per day. Um, and our effluent quality was well within our permanent limits. We averaged 90% 90% BOD removal and 95% TSS removal with concentrations of 20 and 13 milligrams per liter respectively. Copy of the pump station flows for the month of February is also included in your packet. As noted, there were there was a rain snow melt event on the 24th that caused essentially all of the pump stations to have higher flows on that day. Also, there were two anom anomalies: uh, one due due to a communication failure, and one due to a power outage. Uh, on March 14th, the district received a call concerning a blockage block sewer service at 383 U.S. Route 1. The owner of the building had had the TVs, had the, uh, the service TV'd, and it showed a collapsed joint at, at the main. Uh, the district uh, called Risbear, who made the repair uh, the, the next day. Uh, the automatic transfer switch for the emergency generator at the plant failed this past month. Uh, Russell Electric uh, troubleshot the switch for us and made the necessary repairs. The cost of this unbudgeted item was $9,000, but more importantly, we were revised the, that the electronics of the switch will no longer be supported after this year. 
consequently, we'll budget $15,000 for its replacement in 2020. As you know, recently we had a failure with our HAC SC1000 DO controller. As a result of this event, Glenn and I have been looking into alternatives to provide full redundancy of our control scheme, one of which included migrating over to YSI controllers. Uh, with that in mind, Glenn and I visited the uh, wastewater treatment facility in Newmarket, New Hampshire, and talked to the operators and looked at their YSI system to gauge a feeling of ease of use and reliability. We're still you know, evaluating our options at this time. <coughs> On the 14th this past month, I presented at the Wentworth Intermediate School STEAM Night. This event, I had a microscopic demonstration with samples of mixed liquor, which would lead into a discussion of how wastewater is treated. I also had the Enviroscape model, which demonstrates non-point uh, pollution, various informational handouts, and the now infamous I Poop Today stickers, which were requested specifically by the school's principal, Mrs. Crosby. Um, Let's see, on uh, Scarborough High School's uh, AP environmental class uh, will be coming out to the plant on April 8th for a tour of the facility and, uh, and a discussion of how uh, we do our job. Um, it's actually a fairly large crowd. I believe there's going to be 19 students coming. So Glenn and I will be uh, splitting up the group and doing two tours to, to accommodate the, the, the group. See, I've met with Underwood to help develop a scope of work for our sludge dewatering study. At this time, we discussed process <coughs> alternatives, including uh, the AO process, which we'll be exploring in more detail. A couple other miscellaneous items. Uh, uh, not so miscellaneous, actually. Um, Verizon uh, has, was recently at the uh, planning board, and they have now since uh, given them more direction to uh, relocate the tower uh, in what has been uh, identified as um, alternative B or site B on various plans. And so they're currently doing some survey work and we'll be developing an amend amended lease agreement for our review in the near term. Um, let's see. And one of the big items on the list that just really came up um, starting last Friday was a memo I received from uh, DEP with regards to PFAS compounds. And um, this is actually uh, a developing story. Uh, the, e the email with the memo <coughs> uh, came on Friday that essentially uh, said that all um, land applications of uh, biosolids are to cease in the state of Maine until uh, uh, some testing is completed uh, with regards to PFAS compounds on that product. Um, it's been a bit of a whirlwind trying to figure out exactly what needs to be done, but uh, we're working with uh, Casella Organic, uh, Organics on this and also DEP to, to developing a sampling program that we need to do and um, what's going to come of uh, land application of biosolids in the state. That's all I have right now. Any questions for the superintendent, Ben? Um, Underwood Engineering, uh, AO, I'm trying to think, I can't, the acronym AO. Anaerobic Oxic. Anaerobic Uh, any more questions? Charlie? Just to uh, follow up on the restriction on land application of sludges, um, how widespread is this problem in the state of Maine? And, and, uh, we don't know. Um, it all stems from a farmer down in Kennebuck, I believe. Yes, Mr. Stone. And, and who has um, uh, PFAS, uh, had sludge spread on his field. I believe, actually, that it was a paper mill sludge that was actually applying PFAS to its paper well, mill products. Is my he is uh, 
extended a lawsuit against Kenny Bung Sewer District, a Gunford Sewer District, and potentially DuPont for creating the product. Um, as of Friday, they hadn't been served with papers yet, so I don't know how that stands. What happened was <coughs> KKW, the water <coughs> district, sunk two wells either on his land or adjacent to his land. And because of their drinking water standards for PFAS, they, de they detected it in those two wells. They had to shut them down. They explained to Mr. Stone that there's an issue with his land. They had to add a sophisticated carbon filtration system to remove the PFAS before the wells could be put back online. He has tested his hay and his milk he can't sell it to Oakhurst now because of what's in it. And as for how widespread this is, every single wastewater treatment plant in Maine is now required to analyze its sludge for PFAS. We don't, we don't know how widespread it is. The governor is, uh, said, sent a directive to stop plant applications at this point. So, you know, if we can't figure it out, well, it has to be figured out shortly because um, 160 plants here in the state of Maine. We can't all go to a landfill for a very long period of time. So it's a significant issue. And it's not just land application. It's Casella who takes our biosolids, digests them or composts them of both, and turns it into a saleable product, fertilizer. And they can't be selling that if it's got PFAS in it. And these chemicals. So if, they t if, if Casella's tests are negative, then they'd be able to resume the their sales, operation. Sales yes. And application or yes. That. Okay, thank you. Any more thoughts, questions on that one? Any more questions for Dave? So just a question follow up on that. I might have missed it. So does that mean we're just going to have to be stockpiling our. our Stuff for compost and sludge currently? No, not at the, at the moment. Um, uh, Casella Organics is still um, transporting um, and receiving sludge at their facility. Okay. Um, they are working with uh, DEP. Apparently, they've already done some PFAS testing of their final product, and they do have some numbers in hand. And so they're trying to get DEP to accept those numbers so they can move forward. Um, I mean, their facility is uh, about 80% full at this point, and they, you know, they're coming knocking on their the door of their distribution period. Um, so they got they, This is the time that they distribute. So they're trying to move this process along as quickly as possible. Thank you. Um, I did have a question about the sludge dewatering study, not only are you changing or looking at potential changes to the process to an anaerobic oxic one, are you looking at dewatering equipment? Yes, that's the sludge dewatering study is really, that, that's what that is about, is looking at alternatives for sludge dewatering purposes. Okay. The AO process was a secondary conversation that we had. Ah. As a result of the bio-wind modeling we did last year. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so we, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do is uh, do some <coughs> preliminary testing on the uh, aeration tanks. Um, after the second uh, aeration tank, we did some BOD analysis to see if we met our BOD and DSS requirements at that point in time, and we have with mm -hmm. only two, the first two stages. So that's positive. That is positive. a good sign. And the equipment you're looking at to replace for dewatering. Do you have a schedule for that? Or are you looking long term? We're just in the develop point of developing the scope of work. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Correspondence. Uh, I wrote uh, to Tom Hall advising him of the likeliness of a sewer rate increase for 2020 and he requested that he share this information with his department heads. Um, Let's see, included in the packet is an ability to serve letter for a proposed development, including 52 single family homes um, and a restaurant. 
uh, to be constructed on the land that is currently accessed by Dorado Drive, which is off the of Spurway. Want to hear from correspondents? Any questions about the correspondents? Charlie, uh, just a follow up on the communication to um, Town Manager Hall. Um, is he going to notify the school department uh, of that? Are we assuming that's going to happen, or should we also notify the superintendent or the business manager for the schools? I will take it upon myself to do that. I assumed he would, but there's that division there, yeah. and, and it's, it, you're right, I shouldn't have assumed that. Matter of fact, I am meeting with uh, Todd Jepson next week, who's the facilities manager over there. So. All right, all business. Um, the, uh, page uh, I'm going to schedule, if it's okay with the trustees, a uh, <laughs> workshop on the 25th to discuss the updates to the uh, sewer rules and regulations. And at the same time, I would like to piggyback. Um, uh, a um, workshop with regards to the uh, sewer user rates um, and I'd like to believe an hour and a half would be needed to do the two at the same time. Mm -hmm. Any questions, comments? So that would be at 7.30 or? Well, no, 7.30 is when our meeting starts. Here, a regular meeting, so I back up uh, be six o'clock. Okay, new business. Um, Willette and Associates have completed the 2018 annual audit of the district's financial statements, uh, a copy of which I I ended up having to email out to you. Uh, no significant issues or findings were identified. Uh, as in the past, Mike Dunn from Willette Associates, who led the uh, um, audit, is here to make a presentation with regards to it, and I recommend approval. And he will speak towards the audit points. Okay. Um, Bob do we need a motion or do we just invite him up to give him? I think we'll just invite him. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Okay. Favorites on. Thanks, thanks again for the trustees to invite me to uh, present the annual audit. Um, everybody should have in front of you uh, a copy of the PowerPoint that I'm going to be going through along with uh, a governance letter and a copy of the um, audited financial statements. Uh, the PowerPoint that I'm going to be presenting, it it's, has summary slides in there that also connect with all of these reports and letters that I've handed out. Um, one report that I have not handed out, um, just so the trustees know, is that there was a copy sent um, to the state of Maine as required under the municipality division. Um, they just retain a copy to make sure that you've been audited. Uh, per se, and, and if you had federal money in that type of um, those types of expenditures, which you do not, so that's all the communication is. Again, a just quick overview of the purpose of the audit. Um, <clears throat> we're an independent third party uh, accounting firm that has been hired by the trustees to perform an audit on the annual financial statements. Um, as a as a purpose, this this provide we when we perform our audit, perform our procedures, we provide an opinion on the financial statements, which then provides assurance to any readers of the financial statements that everything's accurate and presented fairly. Um, a couple other objectives that occur as part of the audit. Uh, when we, as part of the audit, we look at the internal controls of the district, all the processes. Um, and we um, look at the internal controls to see if there's proper controls over financial reporting 
Um, if we have any suggestions or comments on those, we will provide those in a separate letter, which we did not find any, any significant issues with internal controls. Uh, the third, third objective is um, the financial statements are presented under generally accepted accounting principles. Um, and with those principles, there are sometimes new standards that come out that may change how you're reporting in your financial statements. When these, when these standards come out, we, um, as part of our audit, we help management the system in implementing those standards if they are applicable to the district. So that's just a quick bullet point view of what our audit is. Uh, the first piece of information I'm going to go over is the letter. The governance letter you should have in front of you. The governance letter is a required communication at, at the end of the audit. It has certain areas that were required to communicate and they're in bold throughout the letter. I have them summarized on the slide. Um, the first section talks about the qualitative aspects of accounting practices, um, and in particular, uh, those accounting standards that, that possibly occur. Um, also, significant estimates in your financial statement and significant disclosures. Um, this year, there were two new accounting policies adopted, standards implemented into your financial statements. One of them was GASB 75, which deals with the accounting and financial reporting of post-employment benefits other than, other than pensions. Um, it's, it's, it's covers all benefits that are other than pensions, but it's in particular it's, it has to deal with health benefits. Um, the second uh, is the Omnibus 2017. This, is, uh, this standard had very little impact on the, on the district's financial statement. Um, this is released primarily to um, update certain standards that were released in the past. So certain parts of it may, may be applicable, but a majority of it was not. So that had no significant impact on the financial statements. Um, we'll, we'll go over the GASB 75 uh, later on in the presentation. Uh, the most significant, the next, the next section of that letter talks about accounting estimates. The district has accounting estimates in their financial statements. Um, the most significant one is depreciation. Uh, depreciation is the purchase of assets and then expensing the asset over the life, the estimated life of the asset provided by management. Um, we've looked at the estimated lives and, and evaluated key factors and assumptions when we looked at this, how this estimate was recorded and uh, we found it reasonable um, in relation to the financial statements. Should we interrupt or wait till the end? You can interrupt. Okay. <laughs> so OPEB, do we have OPEB? Any yes. OPEB? We do have? Yep. Okay. Yes, you do. Okay. Uh, the third area are significant disclosures. And we didn't really have any significant disclosures. But I did put up on the slide that there is a new disclosure on OPEB. And again, I'll go over that towards the end. It's, it's basically the last note in the financial. Um, actually, I could go over it right now. It'd probably be easier instead of waiting until the end. Um, so as, as, part of, as part of providing health insurance, the district pays premiums to um, maintenance bill health trust. Um, and as, as those in premiums are paid in, there's a part of the health trust that offers a benefit to retirees. And that benefit is to allow them to purchase, although they're not working for the district anymore, them or their spouse can purchase health insurance um, kind of in a, in a COBRA manner, meaning they pay for it out of pocket and not the district. But it does allow them that benefit to buy insurance through the, the, the main municipal trust. Um, because of that benefit, there is an implied uh, liability to the district. Um, I looked into, I, I looked into um, how that liability actually is created, um, and it's basically a, a shared liability amongst all districts that are 
that are members and, and purchase premiums through Maine Municipal. So the, the cost of that premium is reduced because of the number of, of districts and municipalities that are paying into that. It's not a direct or, um, uh, you know, something that the district is contributing to or something that um, requires assessment by the trust. It it's looks at the total possible liability, looking at the age of the employees in the, in the cost of health care, and then with an actuary um, projecting out what that possible liability is. Um, and Mike, do you mind letting us know what OPEB actually stands for? Um, OPEB is, is post-retirement uh, post benefits other than pensions. Or other pension, other pension other employee benefits. Other post-retirement employee other benefits. Post Sorry. <laughs> So if, if we turn to the note, um, we'll skip right to it, in the back of the financial statement, it's on um, page 20, it's on page 20, it's the last note, note 7. Yeah, I had a discussion with management concerning this. Um, the communication from <laughs> Cherry and the, the actuaries that performed and provided the information to the district in a report um, indicated that the current OPEB mm -hmm. liability is 78137 um, We looked at that compared to um, the impact that has to the financial statements. Again, accounting-wise, where the district isn't making any contributions to this plan, they're not getting assessed by the trust, any costs for this plan, um, and this is a projected liability in the future uh, based on the dollar value of $78,000. Um, we deemed it immaterial that it should be required to be recorded. Now, in the future, that that liability may increase to a point where it should be recorded on, and on your financial statements. Um, the, the accounting for that um, directly is, is the actuary and the audit is performed at the trust and the information is provided back to the district, which should be included in your financials. The, the footnotes that would actually appear in your financials are about four pages long, and they provide the reader with information concerning um, assumptions, um, discounts, investments, all kinds of information on the plan, on health costs, and um, increases, decreases, 1% increased, 1% decrease type um, reaction to that liability. Uh, where I, I, I kind of advised, I didn't kind of advise, I advised the management that they should hold off recording this because it, what, what it would do is provide a, a lot of information to your financial statements that I don't think at this point has any particular value or usefulness to your, to your financial statement. If you were possibly going out for a bond or, or um, maybe thinking about introducing a, your own post-retirement plan, then I would say you should probably adopt and record that. And, and when, I, when I talked to the superintendent about it, I said we're gonna, it's going to be something we're going to look at at an annual basis. Um, and it is also something that we can discuss with the trustees if, if they do want to have that liability recorded. Accounting-wise, like I said, it doesn't impact your budget. There is no money flowing in or out of it. Um, and it's merely recording or updating that liability based on the information we get from the actuary on an annual basis. So you will see that liability go up and you will see it go down. So, so that's, so in, in lieu of doing a full recording of the liability on the financial statements and including three or four pages of, of footnotes in the back of your financial, we opted just to put a general disclosure so that 
any reader of the financials knows that that liability exists and that at this point in time it has not been recorded because it isn't significant to the financial statements. So is this a liability that will accrue annually? It could, it could fluctuate. Um, it can fluctuate up and down based on the assets and the liabilities of the trust and what is allocated to the district based on an actuarial analysis of health costs and their employees and their age. Did you say COBRA? Well, I, I use the word COBRA meaning it acts like a COBRA for a retiree. But it's more than 18 months. So, yes. so is there a change that we could make to um, our participation in this program that would make this liability go away? I'm not familiar with the agreement with Maine Municipal Health Trust, but if you purchased your insurance somewhere else, then that would eliminate the liability. It's a benefit with the trusts that it provides to all all people that buy, all districts, municipalities that buy health insurance through them. They provide that additional benefit that when they retire, they can still purchase insurance and usually what, what the plan is to buy insurance for three to five years until they can get on Medicare or something like that. Right, but this is, this is a feature that, that the trust offers, not something that the district by its choice has signed up to support. It, it's part of our, our health plan. You know, just like for me for the city, if I retire, I can participate in the same health care program that the rest of the current employees are utilizing. I just have to pay whatever the rate is. And if we change the plan, the health care plan, they have to go along with that idea. So it's not really a COBRA but it allows them to buy into the plan of the current employees. <clears throat> at full cost. At, at, at full cost, cost to them, yes. correct. No well, I guess, the uh, I guess I'm a little confused because if, if, if the employees are choosing to s pursue this option after their employment with the district is concluded and they're paying the full cost, I'm not sure I really understand why the district is incurring any liability. It should be the employees who are incurring the liability. I am unsure myself exactly how they make that connection. Um, however, the actuaries and the auditors of the trust have looked at the plan and anybody that participates has the ability to, um, you know, participate in that plan and buy insurance. I'm not exactly sure how they can assess the district for any issues in the future with that, um, but they've, they've deemed that it is applicable to GASB 75 and that liability is allocated to the district. So I'm not comfortable with that. And I would think that we would want to follow up with them to, to ascertain exactly how an employee's participation in their program after they no longer employed, are employed with us constitutes a liability to the district. And then I think we ought to think about um, whether or not that's an aspect of the program that they provide that we want to participate in. Is there a way for us to opt out of that at, okay. at some point in time? I don't know whether I don't know whether they'd be able to come after us three years from now for the accumulated accumulated liabilities over the last three or four years, whatever it might be. But I mean, if it's seventy eight thousand a year, you know, in in four years, that's three hundred thousand dollars. I don't think the seventy eight thousand represents um, a full liability that they come in. It's a projected liability of all the individual employees based on their date of retirement. 
and the health costs at that time. It doesn't, so it's, it's doesn't a, accrue year to year. It doesn't so accrue. It's 78,000 plus 78,000 plus Yeah, I, I, I've worked with a number of districts that um, have a similar GASB 68 that deals with pensions that have a similar type um, reporting, disclosure um, with a trust, you know, the main state retirement trust that, that has assets and liabilities that go up and down and I can tell you that over the past five years since that's been implemented in some districts that choose to use main state retirement, um, I've seen the liability fluctuate up and down each year. So Okay, I'm just I'm just confused about why we would be responsible for a liability incurred to service a pat a, a former employee who chooses to participate with them. So I guess the superintendent can examine that and get back to us on it because I need some clarification on that. So Michael, I, I think is it and you may not know the answer to this, but is it because the there could be a liability not from the employee, but just that the trust, I mean the municipal insurance has that if they have a, a huge claim that comes back, it's, it's a liability we already have from our uh, employee employees that are. That are <coughs> My understanding is that it's projected from your current employees, that, that portion of the benefits, and, and the liability is primarily health care costs. Um, it affects our rates. It yeah. affects your rates. Based on the age of the employee, um, current health care market costs. And so, it's from my understanding, the liability is essentially to our current rates with our current employees. So, but I mean, whether it's beneficial, excuse me, it's unless it's beneficial for, you know, the superintendent just to get an understanding of what that liability is to report back to us, or maybe invite somebody from Maine Employee Health Trust to come in and explain the plan to us at a time. Yeah. Um, because I'm not sure that, uh, I, I think, you know, the first direction of getting a little clarification about what that actual liability looks like to us and our financials is important, but I'm not sure that the questions will stop just with that. And I don't know as if, um, you know, sending Dave back time and time again, you know, it might be beneficial to have him come down to a representative, a representative come down and make a presentation to us. It's okay with me. Huh? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Benefits is one thing that I do do. <laughs> so should we resume the accounting Sorry. discussion? Go back to the go back to the slide of the letter. Helpful. Any other questions on that? The other was the only OPEG. Yes, OPEG. Yeah. These other areas that I have up there bolded difficulties performing the audit. Uncorrected misstatements, disagreements with representations or other consultants, other audit findings, issues, and other matters. We didn't have any of those per se in there. Attached to this letter is um, uh, uncorrected, what we call an uncorrected misstatement, which is your OPEB liability. Um, that's what the adjustment would look like if we were to record it in your financial statements. It basically shows that um, there is. The, the actual liability is is eighty six thousand dollars offset by a deflow, uh, deferred outflow of sixteen thousand, um, which is kind of like a liability and a prepaid asset netted together to get your total seventy eight thousand um, dollars. To to implement that seventy eight thousand, you would have to restate your two thousand seventeen financials to put on the liability of 2017. Um, other than that, uncorrected misstatement, um, we didn't have any other issues performing the audit and it actually went very smoothly. Wendy had everything ready, plus plus. <laughs> <laughs> so we can move on to the financials. Where, where does it show the uncorrected uh, liabilities? In the should, back of it should be in the back of the letter. There should be an attachment. 
I'm hoping it's there. It's there. It's there. Yeah. 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 This document. Oh. It's the second piece. There you go. <coughs> there it is. Thank you. We all settle that? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Looking at the financial statements, the structure of the financials are still the same as prior years. It starts out with the Independence Auditor's Report um, on pages one and two. Um, the management discussion analysis on pages three through ten. Then the financial statement, statement of net position, page 11. Statements of revenue and expenses for the year, change in net position on page 12. Statement of cash flows on pages 13 and 14, and then the notes to follow that. Um, as I go through the slides and certain areas of these financials, I may make a reference to the notes because in the notes, um, sometimes it discloses a, um, that, that number that we're looking at or that area in a little bit more detail. Um, following the notes, there are two supplemental schedules of operating expenses to show the natural expense category and to which cost area of the district those expenses are, are, being, are being reported to. Following, that, following those two supplemental schedules is the superintendent report for 2018. So pages one and two uh, is the independence audits report. This is where we provide our opinion. It's on the bottom of page one. Um, again, it's an unmodified opinion, clean opinion. Um, for 2018, December 31st, 2018. Page two at the top is, is the, um, we put an emphasis of a matter paragraph in our audit report just indicating that you've adopted the two new standards. The next page is three through, three through ten is management's, uh, Management discussion and analysis. Um, I'm not going to go over that, uh, where this is management's um, portion of the report that they insert every year. I'm not going to go through that in detail. And I'm just going to jump right to page 11, the statements of net position. Statements of net position is presented in comparative format, 2018 to 2017. There's no deferred outflows or inflows, so we have a uh, a standard presentation with the assets and the liabilities and, and net position at the bottom. Taking a look at the assets, I have a slide. This is where you can kind of follow along with the slide and the numbers. I've put a five-year trend of the growth of assets. We have, and it's based on the, the presentation in the financial statements. You have cash and then investments, accounts receivable, inventory, and other assets. The, the capital assets are not included in this because of the size would disfigure my, my pretty graph that I have up here. So, um, but if you just kind of glance at the graph, you can tell there is some growth. The district has been growing the past three years. Um, you can see the investments, uh, which are primarily funded by uh, the capacity reserve. Uh, those have been climbing as you've been adding on to the, to the district. Uh, cash cash is, is, has, been, has remained steady for the past two years um, after increasing, which is primarily 2015 is based on rate increases when you started increasing your rates um, for, for, you know, after a, a number of years of not increasing the rates, you started increasing the rates to build up some of these funds after the building of the, of the main plant. So the, uh, the other assets, uh, prepaid expenses and, and bond acquisition fees, and then your, your in normal inventory, which is primarily there for uh, emergencies and repairs. Any questions on that? Uh, the next section is going to be your liabilities. Oh, I put the capital assets in first. I apologize. So I, I put a slide in here this year just to kind of give you an idea of the capital assets with the associated <coughs> bond debt. You can see the, the margin of how much debt the district has left compared to the, the current 
book value of the capital assets that it's been invested into. Capital assets are in a decreasing mode, which is expected. That's your depreciation occurring each year. It's about 1.5 million this year, uh, and will continue going forward in that manner. The debt also is decreasing, which is always a good trend, as that's being paid off. Um, details of, of your debt um, can be found on pages 19 and 20 of your, of your financial statement in the notes. Um, on page 20 is probably the more uh, pertinent part of that disclosure where it shows the future um, debt service that's going to be required, principal payments being made, and it only shows five years. So you have five years left before that's all paid off. The capital assets, the detail of that can be found on pages 18 and 19, and that just basically shows changes and purchases and disposals from year to year. There wasn't a lot of activity in that this year. There's a few areas, but nothing too significant. Taking a look at the liabilities, this is the current liability section. You can see that the current portion of the bonds payable is only five years left. That's, that's decreasing. You lost one of the bonds. Um, also, there is a, a small spike in the accrued expenses this year. That's made up of approximately $9,000 of uh, CMP accruals. Uh, when I discussed that with management, they felt it was appropriate to keep what they thought is a reasonable level of electricity costs in the current year budget, knowing, the, knowing that they would probably be assessed for it in the future, um, and that would keep um, consistent expense um, comparisons from year to year, and probably beneficial to any reader of the financial looking at annual costs. Um, there's another 18000 of that for the billing software that should be implemented shortly. So other than that, there are some other small accruals included in that that are normal accruals compared to prior years. Mike, I have a question. Sure. There's a, an accountant ratio of assets to liability. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that a strong ratio is 2 to 1. Do you know offhand what Scarborough Sanitary District ratio is? Current ratio? The what? The current ratio? Yes. Next page. So, 4 to 1? So, currently you're at 4.9 to 1. Okay. Um, and this, this slide looks a little, little different because at one point the district's investments were part of current assets. You can see that in 2014 and 15. Once those investments started climbing and, and wasn't really considered a current asset, it's more of an other asset. We moved that down in the financial. Um, it, it adjusted your current ratio. Uh, this next slide, though, shows just completely without any of the investments. Um, you can see in 2014 it was at 1.7. It's now grown over the past five years up to a 4.9 to 1. That means you can pay your current liabilities uh, almost five times to 1. You pay them five times. So that's, that is a very strong um, you know, financial indicator. Uh, what, one thing to note is that if you look at your current assets, you're, you're currently at a, at a $3.1 million in your current assets. Your current assets right now can cover all of your liabilities. So that is very strong. Any questions on that, those calculations? At the bottom net position, um, I've broken this out a little bit more um, compared to what's presented on the front. And the only thing I broke out was just the board designated portions, which, which are the investments, the reserve funds. So currently, you're looking at um, about 18, 18 and a half million dollars that have been invested in capital assets. So out of the 24, $24.9 million in net position, 
18, about 18.5 million of that is unspendable as its capital assets. Um, the remaining six, about 6.5 million is made up of 5.2 million of the reserve funds, various types of reserve funds that the district has, and then 1.2 million of operating. Any questions on that? Switching the page to page 12, looking at the statements of revenue and expenses. Again, compared format. These are the annual revenues and expenses um, of the district, 2018 compared to 2017. Um, just looking at the numbers, I put a small graph up to show um, just some, some growth in the, in the revenue areas, especially the user fees. It's been growing about 3% um, a year. Uh, expenses, expenses actually increased this year uh, by about $182,000. That's about a 5% increase, um, creating an operating loss of $354,000. Again, part of that operating loss is $1.5 million of depreciation. So it's not a cash loss, but an operating loss, including your uh, capital assets. There are some non-operating revenues and expenses underneath that, coming down to a change in net position uh, before capital contributions of $401,000 uh, with the capacity upgrade fees. Your change in net position is, is $109,000 for the year. It's a little bit of a decrease from 2017, but that's again primarily um, Pass the upgrade fees, which fluctuates from year to year. Um, probably the more key line would be change in that position before capital contributions or even the operate, operating loss and looking at the, the comparison from year to year. The following statement is this. Is there any questions on that? No, I, I'm just... Uh, I'm a little fuzzy here. Where is the depreciation? Well, the depreciation you can see, you'd, I'd have to refer you to pages uh, in the back, um, pages 21 and 22. Depreciation is going to be a line item on the supplemental schedules. The natural category, the natural expense categories are down the left side of the page. Um, and your various cost centers are at the top. So the bottom numbers there uh, will correspond to this um, statement we were just looking at. Uh, depreciation is at the bottom. So it's included in those expense numbers by cost area. So without depreciation, instead of a three hundred and fifty four thousand dollar loss, it would have been a one point eight million dollars. Right. The the actual next statement, statements of cash flows, that actually shows the cash flows of operations, which takes out depreciation just like you're you're looking at. So if you flip to the next page, page thirteen, and even page fourteen, if you're just looking at at a, the cash flow of the district, um, you're going to be looking at three different areas, the operating activities, investing activities, and financing activities. So this is just talking about cash flow in and out. So a positive number is cash flowing in, the number with the brackets is cash flowing out. So if we look at the top, just, just the cash received from customers, and this includes changes in your receivables, it's about $3.5 $3 million. And from that, you paid paid vendors for goods and services, and also your employees. Um, so cash flow from operating activities is about 1.2 million. With that 1.2 million, you you used a little bit of that in your investing activities. You had some you had some purchases and sales with your investments, which is normal investment activity. Um, plus, you had an increase of uh, capacity upgrade fees, which goes along with the investments, but the net portion of that, that's cash flow, is about 83000 going out. 
and then also your financing activities, which are primarily your principal payments on bond debt, um, and also purchase of capital assets. So, so what this shows me is that from the 1.2 $1 million dollars of operations, um, you basically satisfied all your financing fees to your change in net cash of about $80,000. So you basically operated all within your cash flows for the year. Page 14, again, reconciles that cash flow from operating activities um, by looking at the statement of net position and, and taking out your accruals, also your non-cash activity, which is your depreciation. So that's how you can get from your operating loss of 354000 to that cash flow from operating activities of $1.2 Any questions on that? Finally, the, in the, in, after those statements are the notes. I am not going to go into these, this, uh, uh, many of these notes in a lot of detail. The first section up through page 17 are, is a summary of the accounting policies of the district. Um, besides the adoption of those two new GASBs, there wasn't any changes to these footnotes. They're all um, similar to prior years. Uh, I did mention um, as part of the presentation, um, pages 18 through 20, you're going to see a little bit of detail on your investments, capital assets, um, and then your bonds payable. And we've already gone over um, Note 7 on page 20. So most of those notes are, are pretty much covered already. Any final questions? If there are no questions, I'll entertain a motion to accept the audit as presented. Motion, motion to accept. Second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. again for the invite. Um, part of that Mr. Is Chairman. Yes. Um, I'd also like to move that we accept, in addition to the uh, audit, the superintendent's um, annual report, which in combination would constitute the annual report of the uh, Chicago Sanitary District. Cool. So you moved? Yes. And we need a second? Second. Uh, any discussion on the management discussion analysis? Annual report. Annual report. All in favor? Thank you. None opposed. Move. Thank you. Right. Mike. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thanks, Mike. Um, New Business B, Napa Auto Parts, 238 Gorham Road. Um, on behalf of P2M Development, LLC, Tobago Technics is requesting district approval to connect and discharge into the sewer the sanitary waste for water from a proposed 8,300 square foot office building for Napa Auto Parts. <coughs> The building will accommodate space for a retail store and warehouse. The estimated average daily wastewater flow generated by the new facility is 108 gallons per day. The proposed sewer service consists of approximately 104 linear feet of 6 inch gravity sewer service and one manhole. Currently located on the site are an existing restaurant, formerly Shogun Japanese Steakhouse, and an existing residential house. To facilitate the construction, both the house and the restaurant will be demolished. As part of the eight corner sewer expansion, this parcel was approved for an average daily flow of typical sanitary waste of 1,080 gallons per day. I recommend approval with the following conditions. The approved flow for this parcel is 1,080 gallons per day of typical sanitary waste. 
This flow exceeds the anticipated needs, thus the project does not require additional allocation. Any future flows in excess of the approved amount and characteristics are subject to additional approvals. The approved wastewater flow exceeds the anticipated needs, thus uh, this project will not be subject to any additional capacity reserve free fee. Uh, any future flows in excess of the approved amount and characteristics are, however, subject to those additional approvals. Final plan signed and stamped by a licensed professional engineer submitted to the superintendent for approval prior to issuance of the permits and uh, provide a complete application uh, executed by the owner um, uh, prior to the permit being executed. No site sewer work shall be uh, submitted. And finally, um, professionally surveyed electronic geo reference CAD drawings and a stamped PDF of the CAD drawing, stamped paper copy submitted to the district upon completion of the project. Before we take it up, I, <coughs> I recluse myself from this and, and the discussion because I actually work for bigger thing. Thank you, Ben. So I have a motion to approve. Move approval uh, with the conditions stipulated by the superintendent. Second. Okay, any questions, comments? So it doesn't look like there's going to be any uh, changes to the infrastructure, correct? Uh, they will be uh, disconnecting uh, the abandoning, I should say, the uh, sewer service that's currently used for the restaurant as part of it. Um, I'll, in those situations, I require them to abandon them at the property line. And prior to uh, capping them, we TV the line to make sure that that infrastructure is in good condition because you know, it's the only opportunity we ever have for something like that. So. And then they'll reuse the sewer service that is currently used for the house. Um, same thing, when they cut into it, we'll TV it and make sure it's in good uh, condition prior to moving forward. Okay. And the only reason I was asking is I didn't see your standard tracer line and stuff, but it doesn't sound like, it sounds like that already should be in place, correct? Thank you. Is that a question for the superintendent? He answered. We did. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Comments? All in favor? None opposed, one abstain. Camp Ketchup. Um, 336 Black Point Road. Uh, Camp Ketchup is requesting district approval to connect and discharge into the sewer, the sanitary waste for other from the existing ice house uh, with a proposed bathroom addition for a total square foot of 928 square feet, utilizing approximately 140 feet of gravity sewer service. This connection was originally approved in 1998, but at the time Camp Ketcha had a fire which destroyed the main building, which just put this project on hold. District records indicate that the peak quarter water consumption for this parcel is approximately 1,275 gallons per day. The ice house is estimated to generate an additional 125 gallons per day waste water flow uh, for a total required allocation of 1,400 gallons per day. Uh, Camp Ketcha owns two adjacent parcels, R91-6 and R91-5. Each parcel has a wastewater allocation of 486 gallons per day. Current, uh, currently, R91-5 is unimproved. There are no plans to build upon this parcel. With that, Camp Ketcha would like to transfer the available wastewater allocation from this parcel to R91-6. I recommend approval with the following conditions. Flow be lim limited to 1,400 gallons per day of typical sanitary wastewater flow. Any flows in excess of the approved amounts and characteristics are subject to additional approvals. Transfer uh, the sewer allocation for R91-5 be transferred to R91-6. Moving forward, R91-5 will have no sewer allocation. R91-6 sewer allocation would increase from 486 to 972 gallons per day. 
This property is within the original sewer area, including the transfer of sewer allocation. As noted above, this parcel allocation is 972 gallons per day, typical sanitary waste. With that, the 428 gallons per day above the current allocation are subject to capacity reserve fees of 16.32 per gallon, for a total fee due of $6,984.96. Any flows in excess of the approved flows and characteristics are subject to additional capacity reverse, uh, reserve fees, and then provide a complete application of the building connection permit. Motion to approve. Um, I'll second. That includes the, the conditions, subject and conditions of recommended by the superintendent. A uh, question? Sure. Um, I don't think we've typically allowed allocations to be moved from parcel to parcel. Um, I think in this case, um, it makes sense to do that. Uh, because both parcels are owned by the same by the same entity, <coughs> um, but I think I think we need to be clear that people aren't free to reallocate their uh, allocations from a lot owned by John Smith to a lot owned by Sally Jones. Whereas these are adjoining parcels in the same ownership, it seems to me to make sense to allow that to happen. But I can see where the next step might be uh, something that could be a lot more problematic. So I guess I, I don't want some I don't want somebody viewing to say, uh, okay, uh, you know, in order to avoid paying the passive reserve fee, I can go hunt in the community for somebody who right now isn't using. And ask them to transfer it to me. I think we'd be setting up a sort of an economic market there that nobody wants or intends to see happen. So I, mean, I think we just need to be careful about that. I agree. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Charlie. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So this would be a commercial. Commercial user, and yes. they will have a install a meter. Uh, yeah, they, they will have a meter. Um, they have, they'll have a water meter at the, for this facility, and it, it will be uh, listed as a commercial account. Frankly, I can't see it. It'll, it'll at the estimated flow, they'll be getting the minimum uh, sewer bill, which currently is. Say that again. It, 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 it will be a commercial account. Yeah. And they have a water meter from Portland Water District, and we'll, we will handle this, uh, deal, um, manage this account like if all commercial accounts, uh, based on their estimated water use of 108 gallons per day. That's um, <coughs> less than our. Uh, that is less than what our uh, minimum fee is based on, which is ninety nine dollars, which is the ninety. So they'll get a minimum bill of ninety nine dollars a quarter for this account. You guys can't catch them for this building. They'll, they will have two. The camp catcher, the building, it's the, the primary building will have have one one has a water meter, and then we'll have a separate account for this second building. more confused because we've transferred the two buildings are on the same lot I think I'm with Charlie um, uh, so they wouldn't have just one master meter for both for the entire property then yeah they have two meters they're going to have two, a separate meter for this account in order to track that we're going to have to use it as a separate account yeah if we had, if they had one master meter, we marry the two parcels together. So, given the fact that we shifted the allocation, 
um, would we have to add those two usages together at the end of the month? There, I'm just trying to understand yeah, that. They're, they're on the, we're going to have to give an allocation to the, the ice house and one to the okay. to the, the primary camp. Hence the 900. I get you. And um, you know, and still have we'll manage them on our end almost as separate accounts. But the, the parcel actually is one. The, the, the camp and the ice house are on one parcel. I think is, it, it would clear it up if you just uh, pulled out the plan that's in the packet that would show where the ice house is located with respect to Camp Ketchup main building. It'll show that our 91.5 lot is all wooden, with no buildings on it, which is why we wanted to transfer that allocation from that one particular lot to the main lot that both buildings sit on. Is that correct? think so. <laughs> Essentially, we'll treat this like two sewer bills. One to the other. I, I see that now. So yeah. uh, the primary is the 1,400 gallons per day, which is fine. Mm -hmm. And then the secondary, you're saying, is going to go from uh, to 972, correct? So that's where you're going to get two accounts, and you're going to base the flows off those numbers? Yeah. I'm going to do that. I'll, and I'll split the allocation between the two buildings. I understand that. Thank you. What's, what's, the, the, what's the third building on, on the site? Is that, that's a pool. That's a pool, okay. No facilities there? No. Be a big servo. Hmm? The pool would be a big servo. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Any more questions? We have a motion and a second. I feel very, I feel very stupid right now. So we transferred. Four hundred eighty-six gallons per day of allocation. So, uh, I'm, I'm, but they're only building, they're only going to build the ice house, which is going to be running 108 gallons per day. Mm -hmm. So what's the point of transferring? Because they're currently over their allocation on the property. Oh, oh I, okay, I missed that point. Thank you. That makes sense. Cool. Um, any more questions? Good. All in favor? None opposed. Budget summary. Come uh, on, budget summary. Come on, budget summary is in your packet. I recommend approval. Move approval. Second. Thank you. Any questions, comments? All in favor? Public comments, we have no more public left, so we'll move on to trustee comments. Let me start to my left, Charlie. Um, I guess I'd like to express my appreciation to Dave uh, and our staff and their work with the school students. I think, I think it's great to give them some practical, real-world real world, uh, knowledge of the application of science to everyday everyday life in the community and they'll have a better understanding of what wastewater treatment facilities actually do and the service that we provide but also maybe broaden their horizons enough so that they can think about career opportunities in science engineering in the in the wastewater and water technology fields which are pretty extensive if you take the blinders off and realize what's going on out there. So I think that's really a, a real positive. 
Yeah. I'm oh. very excited about this tour. I'm very happy that it's taking place. Yeah, that's great. And I also want to uh, uh, thank the staff for their efforts all year long that result in us getting such a positive annual audit report from, from our auditors. Um, and note that um, while, while we say it's an uneventful report, it's actually a very positive report of the district's uh, financial record keeping and operations. And again, for the, I don't know, end year in a row, we've had no management letter advising us of shortcomings or deficiencies. And so, I guess we'd like to think of that as ho-hum, but I think that's an indication of ongoing excellent work on the part of our staff. So I'd just like to express my appreciation to them for their continued work and cooperation with the trustees to make sure that uh, everything's transparent and we're record, our record keeping and uh, uh, bookkeeping is um, excellent. So thank you. And the Red Sox were leading one to nothing <laughs> at the, at the uh, top half of the first inning as I drove in tonight. So opening day is here, and that's a sure sign of spring, even if the weather isn't. <laughs> Yay. Um, ben. Yeah, I echo Charlie's comments on the uh, audit report and also the community involvement with the, with the school. That's good. It's a good effort on, on days and uh, you know, in the staff. And it's, we're off to a good start in the year. Cool. Comments. Our newest member, Paul, any comments? Uh, no comments, thanks. Joe. Uh, I'd also like to echo the comments <coughs> uh, for the annual review. Um, I think it's impressive that uh, we managed to spend what was coming in as, uh, and didn't overdraw those, so it was nice to see the operating Mine was within our means. Um, so I thank Wendy and the superintendent for preparing all that stuff and for another seamless audit report. Excellent job. And as always, thank you for the staff for their continued efforts. And uh, Charlie, the Yankees won today, 7-2. to two. <laughs> Just so you know. <clears throat> thank you. I'm sure they're going to win 100 games this year. <laughs> okay. Don't think it'll be enough. It shouldn't be. Um, first, uh, welcome Paul to the board. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, second, condolences to Charlie and the Anderson family for the loss of Virginia Osborne. My heart goes out to you and to Cindy. Um, congratulations to Ben as the new vice chair. Um, thank you to Riz Bearer Brothers for coming to our rescue once again and repairing that pipe. <clears throat> Thank you especially to Wendy for leading Scarborough Sanitary District to another clean audit. I will echo, echo my fellow trustee comments. I think it's a wonderful thing that you do, and um, I know you have to work hard to get us to such a high standard. Thank you. Um, thanks to Dave for the steam and for the upcoming tour of the environmental uh, class. Um, it should be fun. It should be fun. Enjoy it. Um, and with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn. Second. All in favor. We're done. Thank you.